Hi, welcome to the big city of Hueytown, Alabama, where there's more race cars per square inch than anywhere in the country, and which is fast becoming known for all types of racing. I'm Neil Bonnet. You know, for Al Unser Jr., winning is a way of life, a family tradition. His granddaddy dominated Pikes Peak, and his daddy and his uncle have won Indy seven times between them. Now, that's a tough act to follow, but little Al has proven himself to be an Unser through and through. Some people are just born with talent. He was born with an awful lot of natural talent, what we just call raw talent. I saw it in Parnelli Jones. Troy Rutman obviously had it, but little Al just had an awesome amount of it. And I sometimes think the younger generations now are, are getting it through their genes. But Uncle Bobby will also tell you it took years of very hard work and a lot of dedication. When we come back, we'll show you how the man they call little Al became one of the biggest names in IndyCar racing. Winners is brought to you by Fram Filter Products. Fram, you can pay a little now or a lot later. And Autolite Spark Plugs and Wire and Cable Products. Autolite Spark Plugs, guaranteed for two years no matter how far you go. Most people say the 24 hours of Daytona endurance race is the ultimate test of man and machine. But for one team this year, it was more like a family outing. Now most families might enjoy a spirited game of touch football, but the Unser's, Al Unser Sr., brother Bobby, Bobby's son Robbie, and Al Jr., they have their family fun playing tag with a race car. Have your driver ready. Yeah. 10 minutes early. Yeah, well, we, we, we go that way. For little Al, driving on the same team as his daddy and his uncle is like a dream come true. A dream that began over 20 years ago. Most little boys don't get a chance to watch their daddy at work, but Al Hunter Jr. sure did. And when your old man's a racing legend, those trips to the office can make a big impression. Just like the day little Al watched his dad win his first Indy 500. I was at a, a civic auditorium in Albuquerque New Mexico when and that's how they it was it was the paid uh, big screen you go down and pay and and you saw the race live and and uh, we had front row seats and the screen was really big and the car was just very big to me very big and, and they showed nothing but dad all day because he he smoked him little Al knew right then that he didn't want to be anything but a race car driver as soon as he was big enough to handle a go-kart, he was out there showing everyone that a new chapter in the Unser legend was about to be written. Little Al intended to carry the family torch. He was eight, nine years old, and uh, he didn't know then whether he wanted to, but he was about 16, 17 years old is when he was running the sprint cars and stuff that he uh, finally, I think, realized that that's what he wanted to do. But he soon found out that it wasn't easy being a driver and a schoolboy at the same time. And Al Sr. was determined that his son would earn the high school diploma he himself never had. I didn't do well in school. I, I, uh, I really should have because nowadays I'm, I'm, I'm looking at 20-page at contracts and, and having speaking engagements and stuff like that. And, and uh, now is when I wished I had done better in school. But whatever problem he had in school, he more than made up for it on the go-kart track. Little Al would finally get that diploma, but he was no typical schoolboy. At age 16, he made his professional debut in a sprint car race at Speedway Park, the same track where his father and Uncle Bobby got their start. Those first couple years, Dad uh, would not let me race on a racetrack with a wall all the way around it. He, uh, he didn't want me hitting that wall, and so uh, uh, the first time I actually raced on a racetrack with a wall all the way around it, I hit it. <laughs> Tried to knock it down, <laughs> so he was right. Little Al learned to keep his car on the track in time to run his first road race, the 24 hours of Daytona. What I remember about that is, is that it was the first time I ever had a speedometer, 
in, in a race car, and I was running 180 miles an hour down the back stretch at Daytona, and it scared me to death. I was doing great until I looked at the speedometer, <laughs> and when it said 180, I went, oh my God. From there, it was on to Super V's. That was also when Lil Al made one of his biggest career decisions, leaving Gary Stanton to become the number two driver on a brand new team that Rick Gallas was putting together. Through Bobby and knowing Roger Penske and some of the owners, I developed uh, a real interest in someday owning my own team. And so in 1981, uh, we decided to go Super V racing, and, and fortunately Al Jr. was available. He was driving sprint cars full time then, and he wanted to run, run just a few uh, Super V races. And, we went out and uh, his first race, he sat on the pole at Charlotte and won, won the race. And so he decided that's what he wants to do from now on. And uh, he became our number one driver. And we've been together most of the time since. And that team got off to a roaring start. They won four out of nine races, beating out Pete Halsmer for the series points title. That season, Al Hunter Jr. was named Rookie of the Year. The team was so excited by their early success, they planned to move directly into the kart circuit. But Al Sr. talked them out of it. He knew that little Al just wasn't ready. And if you blow your first season driving a champ car, you don't get a second shot. Dad went ahead and talked Dallas into buying a Can-Am car instead of buying a, uh, an Indy car. And uh, because, as Dad put it to him, he needed the experience as a, as a team owner before he dropped a bunch of money, millions of dollars, into the Indy car. He needed to to do it too, to learn. And I could have gone to Indy with, with a little bit of playing around with my birth certificate, but uh, uh, my father did not want me to go directly into Indy from the Super V's because the gap between the two cars is too big. And, uh, and so he wanted me to have more experience and uh, Can-Am car was perfect. And the Unser Gallus team was perfect too winning one championship after another. They were ready for bigger things. Al's dream was to race against the giants of IndyCar racing. In 1982, he got that chance at Riverside, California. I got to meet one of my goals or accomplish one of my goals, which was to drive an IndyCar and uh, race against my dad, race against uh, all of my heroes, you know, Foyt and Rutherford and John Cock and and all the names that I had grown up with. And then it was a letdown all at the same time because, because uh, I held these men as, as uh, uh, heroes and superheroes and, and not men, they're, they're more than men. And, uh, and my first race out there, I, I, uh, I outrun more than half of them and, and uh, laughed a few others. And, and uh, raced wheel to wheel with my father. And the letdown was that, was, that, um, was that they were men just like me, that they put on their pants one leg at a time, they make mistakes, they, they do everything just like I do. And, and, uh, and so that was the, the little bit of the letdown, but uh, that feeling didn't last long. But mortal or not, Al's daddy still had a few things to teach his son that day. It was a 500 kilometer race. And so the reason why I caught him was because he wasn't racing that hard because it was in the middle of the race. You know, I'm, I'm young and dumb and stupid and all that. And so I'm driving every lap as hard as I can drive it even though I've got 500 some odd miles or laps to go. I didn't know any different. You know, I'm just out there racing. But Junior is nothing if not a fast learner. He has spent his whole life surrounded by the best teachers in racing. On Father's Day in 1984, he won his first IndyCar race ever at Portland with a little help from his daddy's engine. Yeah, it was Father's Day. Dad didn't last long at all. <laughs> I mean, the green flag fell on the start of the race and he pulled it off to the side. His motor puked on, on when he stood on the gas to start the race. His motor blew up. <laughs> Anyone who knows racing will tell you, it takes more than a little engine trouble to keep Al Unser Sr. down. When we come back, we'll show you the Unser family playing their favorite sport. It might not be Indy, but they're competing for the family bragging rights.
if you believe that to be a world-class racer, you've got to thrive on competition, the Unser boys are the healthiest race car drivers in the business. I don't care if it's an Andretti or an Unser or a Ray Hall or a Mears or a Sullivan or, or a Senna or a Prost. I don't care who it is. If they're leading, I want to pass them in the race. He's the type of guy that you just never know where you stand with him because uh, he'll, you'll, you'll see he's not in the ballpark all weekend and all of a sudden in the race he's right there in your rearview mirrors challenging for the lead or, or whatever. And uh, so, uh, you know, he's very crafty in the way he goes about things. He usually comes out on top about everything that we do, uh, pretty much for the whole family. Well, maybe not everything. The fight for the family bragging rights reached its most dramatic peak at Miami in 1985 in an epic showdown between father and son. Al Unser Sr. was going to the final race of the car season, looking to become the oldest IndyCar champ ever. His son, just three points behind, was looking to become the youngest. Lil Al wanted to pay his racing hero the ultimate Unser compliment. He wanted to beat him. We got there and, and uh, dad qualified something like ninth or 10th and I was third or fourth and we only needed one car if I didn't win the race then I needed only one car between uh, myself and my dad for me to win the championship and so we were going into the weekend into race day on Sunday feeling pretty good because dad had like six or seven cars you know, and there were several good drivers. I mean, Emerson Fittipaldi, Mario, uh, Roberto Guerrero, uh, I believe Ray Hall was in between me and Dad. You know, a lot of good guys. So I, I, it was cool for me. I didn't worry too much. And the race starts. We go through turn one. I exit turn one. I look behind me. Dad is one car. There's one car between me and Dad. And I'm going, what's going on? We complete that lap. There's eight cars up against the wall in turn one. And it took all the, guy, all the good guys out between me and Dad. Just wiped them out. And I went, holy cow. Father and son battle each other for the entire race. Then, with four laps to go, Al Sr. overtook Roberto Moreno and held him off all the way. He had beaten his son for the championship by one point. It was heartbreaking at first uh, because I knew I took something away from him uh, before we ever got on the stand or anything. I knew as soon as I got the checkered flag what I'd done. And I think at the time I was sorry, but yet I would have never turned it around any other way because he would have, you would have always had that guilt of giving something that shouldn't have been given. It was great. That I, uh, I was very proud of my father. It was, uh, I learned an awful lot that day, which I was supposed to. And he, he was a coyote, he was a fox. He outdid me. Little Al finally did win his championship, but it wasn't all that glorious. As a matter of fact, he never even made it to the victory party. He wrecked his car. He lay in the hospital with a slight concussion. Al Unser Jr. was all alone when the news came that he had clinched the title. No one's with you in the race car when you do it, so uh, it was it was fitting. It was it was sad that I was not at the racetrack and being able to uh, to share it with my team because my guys and my team are the ones that won that championship, and and uh, and I wished I would have been there to share it with them because uh, they're, the, they're the greatest, they're the best. And so I wished I'd have been part of their party. Al Jr. is a really likable guy, but there was a time when little Al wasn't exactly the most popular driver on the circuit. We'll tell you about that in just a moment. Welcome back to Winners. In just 10 years, 
Little Al Hunter has become one of the best liked and most respected figures in the world of professional auto racing. But it wasn't always like that. In the beginning, Little Al was accused of everything from illegal starts to just plain dirty driving. Word was getting around that Little Al was something of a jerk. But all that changed at the 1989 Indy 500 when he and Emerson Fittipaldi locked horns in a fierce battle a lap and a half before the checkered flag. Fittipaldi and Unser went into turn three trying to lap rookie Johnny Jones. Little Al was determined to win. And when he made his move, their tires touched. Unser's Lola hit the brickyard wall at 200 miles an hour. His dream of an Indy 500 win shattered along with his car. To many race fans, that was the day little Al Luncher grew up. The, all I could really think about was, was, was how much pain that I was in and, and uh, uh, what had happened leading up to the whole thing. And the only thing that, uh, that was really thinking about was that I chased Emerson all day, that he had led that race all day long. And, uh, and that he deserved the win. And so when he came around, I gave him a thumbs up and, and applauded him and, and, uh, and then went back to my own grieving or whatever. We think that the answer came out in him about right then and there. It was good to see that he wasn't hurt. And when he went out there and gave Emma the thumbs up, I was so proud of him. My chest was going out about 10 inches. How can I, at, at 26 or 27, I was 26 years old at that time, not a two-time world champion. I mean, Emerson Fittipaldi, I mean, how can I stand there and knock this guy? Had I known he did it intentionally, if, he'd, if, if I had known that and felt it in my gut and in my heart, then I would have, have taken a whole different, different outlook on the whole thing. But Emerson, I know him as a person, I know him as a race car driver, I know him, uh, all that, and, and he would never do anything like that intentionally. So, um, so that's that. It was a turning point in Little Al's career, the moment where it all came together. Everyone knew he had the skill and the experience and the victories. Now he was going to show everyone that he had the maturity and the class it takes to be a real winner. Little Al's performance that day at Indy earned him respect. But it didn't get him the one thing he wanted most, that trip to Victory Lane at the Indy 500. Indy has kind of been getting away from him. He's been capable of winning the thing on numerous times, and that year, so close, he really should have won the race. You know, lacking for catching those four cars, there was just no doubt. M.O. got the draft from everybody and got up on him, and of course, you know, one or two laps in the end, hey, people roll the hard dice. Little Al was a victim of being at the right place at the wrong time, that's all. The Indy 500 is where my heart is. I race Super V's, I race Can-Am's, I race IMSA, I race IROC, I race all the different cars that I can drive so that I can race the Indy 500. Even for a seasoned veteran, the Indy 500 is special. No matter how many times you drive it, each time it's a new experience. It might be the same oval, but it's never the same race. I've been to eight of them now. I've had eight days, and uh, each day has been different. The weather, the, the wind, the uh, circumstances of the event, everything, even the color of the crowds have been different. The color of the racetrack's different all eight days. So now I'm looking at my ninth day wondering if it's going to be again different, and it probably is. <laughs> Not long after we talked to him, Lil Al got his ninth Indy start. He finished fourth two laps down from eventual winner Rick Mears. So what's next for the man who's raced just about everything with four wheels and a motor and come out on top and ever won? Well, it's been rumored for years that he's been thinking of moving up to Formula One. I would love to go race Formula One, I think. Uh, well, I know for sure that it's a race car I've never driven before, and and, uh, and I would love to drive it and compete in it, just the same as uh, as racing NASCAR, racing the Daytona 500. Uh, if I could race those two 
those two uh, series or those two categories, I feel that would make me a better race car driver for the Indy 500. But that's all just talk for now. These days, Little Al is content with being one of the top IndyCar drivers in the world. And best of all, he's doing it with his family. For the Unser clan, being the best drivers in the world is the family business. It's a tremendous feeling because it, it makes me happy and proud to, to see your son take after you and something that you love and, and a sport that's good. Uh, and for him, for the boy to do as well as he does in it, it makes me very proud. And making his daddy proud was a big reason little Al got into auto racing in the first place. But as proud as they are of each other, just watch the next time they drop that green flag and the answers go at each other. Hey, it's a family tradition. Thanks for joining us on Winners. I hope you're beginning to like the show coming out of Hueytown. But please don't move here. We're overcrowded as it is. See you next time. Winners has been brought to you by Autolite Spark Plugs and Wire and Cable Products. Autolite Spark Plugs, guaranteed for two years no matter how far you go. And Fram Filter Products. Fram, you can pay a little now or a lot later. <laughs>